except we have a Saturday workshop. That's right. Yeah, so I just thought, yeah, well, half a day, half a day. So it's kind of actually like Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, oh, thanks for bringing it home, Councilman Hancock. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no rest for the weary, I guess. Got about one minute left. Want to make sure everybody who wants to be on is here. It's a gorgeous day outside. I'm so glad. I'm so ready for spring and and to get Thank my you. garden in and do all that Although nifty it's, stuff. It's the weather's turning now. See, over here by my house, it's still looking hopeful. Oh, is but, it? Uh, I actually uh, sat out after we after I met with the mayor this morning okay. over at uh, Atria and the new senior development. I actually came back and sat on my patio. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is now two o'clock. Welcome to the Transportation Airports and Public Works Committee. I am your chair, Stephanie Hancock, along with council members Angela Lawson and Francoise Bergen. Welcome everyone to the call. We're going to conduct some business today. Um, our goal is to ensure excellent infrastructure that is well maintained and operated. Woo woo. Um, <laughs> First things first, um, I wanted to see if we can get approval of the March minutes. If there, if anyone has any uh, amendments, changes, or corrections. No, I approve. I'm... Okay, seeing none, we approve. We'll just move on. Um, I don't have any consent items on this agenda this month, so we'll move right into general business. Uh, item 4A, Parker Quincy Smoky Hill Project update. Um, with Kathy Valencia, I believe, and Michelle Gardner. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Right. Let's right. jump right in. We're ready. Okay. Excellent. I will share my screen. And Cindy, I'm not sure I'll be able to see if any hands come up. So let me know if anyone has a question, um, but I'll go ahead and get started. So I'm Kathy Valencia. I'm the Transportation Project Delivery Manager in Public Works. And today I will be giving everyone here an update on the Parker Quincy Smoky Hill Improvements Project. So this project began as a study in 2016 to identify improvements that could reduce congestion and improve operational okay. performance and safety in the project area. The project limits included the intersection between Parker Road and Quincy Avenue. And we also looked at the intersection of Quincy and Smoky Hill and Quincy and Chambers. We are currently finishing up final design for the project. The project implements operational improvements, including triple right turn lanes from westbound Quincy to northbound Parker, a triple left turn lane reconfiguration from northbound Smoky Hill to westbound Quincy, Safety improvements include driveway consolidation and access restriction. Accessibility improvements include new curb ramps, improved connection to Cherry Creek State Park, and new and widened sidewalk. And here is a graphic showing the planned improvements. On the west side of the project limits, there will be a new sidewalk connection on the west side of Parker Road, where currently there is none. There will be access restriction at the intersection of Parker Road and Rice Place, so left turns out of Rice Place will be restricted. However, you can U-turn at parking, Parker and Quincy um, for people who live in that little area right there. The intersection of Parker and Quincy will include triple right turn lanes and new curb ramps, and we will shift the Cherry Creek Trail connection to the north side of the intersection. There will be new widened sidewalk on the north side of Quincy Avenue, and the intersection of Quincy and Smoky Hill will include corner radius modifications to improve the double right turns and pedestrian crossings over here. So this project is partially funded through Transportation Improvement Program grant administered by Dr. Cog. The first column in this table shows the project funds as they were originally awarded when the city won funding for the project. And then in 2021, we received more funding for the COVID relief funds. So in total, the city will be receiving almost 6 million towards construction. And then the third column just shows the project funds as they are tracked um, through the CDOT IGA 
because CDOT does not track overmatch. So it's just the local match of 20%. So here's our project timeline. As mentioned earlier, this project began with the study completed in 2016. Um, existing conditions, including environmental and utilities, was completed in 2020. We then went through preliminary design, environmental documentation, and right-of-way coordination with impacted properties. Uh, NEPA clearance, National Environmental Policy Act, was received in July of 2024. 2023, I think that was supposed to be, sorry. Uh, <laughs> we are currently in final design and expect to receive city and CDOT approvals by August of this year. And we're hoping to go to construction in the fall and expect construction to last one year. So that was the update. And then I can answer any questions or discussion that anyone has. Does anyone have any practice. questions for? I just want to say hooray. About <laughs> time. <laughs> Happy. Yep. I'm really um, excited for those triple right turn lanes. <laughs> Um, Chair Hancock, I just have a question and a comment as well. I'm so glad this is being done. Um, this is really going to improve this area significantly um, based on safety and just the amount of traffic and growth. It's a very dense area, but it has a lot of connectivity. So I want to say I'm really, really happy about the project. Um, with the year time frame, I guess I'm wondering how are we going to get out information to the residents who are going to be impacted? Um, mm -hmm. That's a long time and there's probably yeah. going to, and I'm going to probably get a lot of the grunt <laughs> of the calls about everything. So um, maybe you guys could be able to be able to prep me or something like that, but it is going to be really impactful in some ways. So I just wanted yep. to know um, how's that communication plan going to be developed or the time frame. Sure. No, that's that's a great point. Um, and we will definitely keep you in the loop when construction begins. I know we have a project website set up already, and we're going to be coordinating with communications on public outreach um, to keep the public informed. So I will find out more information, but um, definitely we'll keep you in the loop as we proceed. Well, that be my question too. So you you were thinking the same thing I was, um, because that's a major artery, and so we want to make sure people are aware. Because um, yes, Councilmember Lawson will be getting a lot of emails mm -hmm. and phone calls, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and and me too, ancillary because we're bumping up right against that. So thank you very much. Are there any other questions, uh, Councilmember Bergen, Councilmember Lawson? Okay, yeah. all right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're looking forward to seeing that actually come to fruition, which is wonderful. So let's move on to 4B, the resolution by the City Council of Aurora to adopt the fiber optic master plan uh, presentation by staff. I'm not going to mention everybody. We'll just let you just jump right in there. That sounds great. Um, I'm going to kick us off for this effort. Hopefully you can see my screen. Um, all right. Hopefully it worked. Okay, getting the thumbs up. Thanks, Josh. Uh, so uh, thank you, Chair Hancock, members of the committee. I'm excited to present today on our uh, citywide fiber optic master plan project. Um, and this is a resolution to adopt uh, this plan. Um, so this was really a citywide effort. Um, it was led by myself as well as Josh Smith and IT. Um, and we also have Angela Simseha was very involved in water. And uh, I see Chris Blyden on as well, as well as Brent Bundy. And they were all very, very involved in this process and really instrumental to finishing this up and bringing it forward. Um, so I'm Carly. I think you've seen me on the TAPS committee before, but I'm the traffic manager in the Public Works Department. And uh, this presentation is really going to be done by myself and uh, Josh in IT. So I'll let Josh introduce himself and then he'll be kicking us off as well. Thanks, Carly. Uh my name is Josh Smith. I'm the technical infrastructure manager for the IT department. Um, I handle pretty much the wide area network and the local uh, the local area network. So um, my teams handle all that communication. Uh, the systems team also handles a bunch of that. Those are all part of my teams. So we are heavily invested in fiber uh, within the city. We don't have a lot of fiber. We want a lot more, which is what we're talking about today. 
Um, so we'll kind of walk through that. Carly, do you want to switch to the next slide, please? Yes, yes. And Angela, do you want to introduce yourself really oh, quickly too, if you don't mind? Oh, it's okay. Sure, Angela Sims say hi. I work for Rural Water. I'm the Water Technical Operations Superintendent, and we have partnered on this project with Public Works in an effort to do a citywide strategy that will benefit all departments, and especially for water, the operational technology for critical infrastructure. Uh, and that's what uh, we're hopefully will talk about today. So thank you for having us. Thanks, Angela. So just to cover fiber, you know, fiber is a light path, essentially, right? We are sending light down small strands of glass uh, that is run underneath city streets, through city sidewalks, et cetera. Um, you know, the purpose of fiber uh, in the city is to communicate between city facilities and field devices. You know, those could be traffic signals, that could be water facilities, uh, critical infrastructure, it could be PD facilities, et cetera. Um, right now, uh, our fiber is very limited. We do have strands that run from the AMC out to a CDOT slash RTD right of way that run north and south. Um, we do have a few facilities that are on that particular piece of fiber. That's pretty much it uh, from a city perspective of fiber. Water does have more fiber in the ground than we do. Um, traffic's about the same boat that we are. We just don't have a ton at this particular point. So one of the things that we really are hoping for is to uh, get more fiber into the city to allow us to operate signals more quickly and to provide better bandwidth for our city facilities. Currently, we contract out most of our city facilities to uh, providers that are local, Lumen, CenturyLink, uh, same company. Um, we're looking at Comcast, some of it as Unite. So we do have some other companies that we do partner with. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, like Carly mentioned, we did sit down together and really work on a master plan. Uh, we worked with a company outside of uh, the city with a molar and associates to help develop it um, currently we're in the end of that you know we have a draft proposal put together um, that did look across all of our departments uh, they these are the departments that are really involved in the applications of the fiber we are the heavy users of it right we are um, facilitating that usage throughout the entire city we did look at our existing conditions uh, we do have some fiber in the ground uh, like i mentioned earlier that we are using for certain facilities. We don't have a ton, uh, like we mentioned earlier as well. So this is really looking at saying, okay, what does it look like for us to move forward? Uh, and I think Carly is the next slide and she can do go into some of the phases and stuff that we looked at um, to expand this out. Yeah, thanks, Josh. So we're going to go over some more details about the plan. Um, this this planning effort was pretty extensive, and we actually separated it into three separate documents, which are attached to the TAPS item as well. Uh, so we separated the project phases into an existing conditions phase where we really evaluated what do we currently have out there, what devices do we have, what do we need to connect, um, and then we use that information to roll it into a future plan to say what do we want our future network to look like. Um, and then from there, we have another plan that is the, our, what we call our deployment plan, which really tried to chop it up into um, what's the highest priority, medium and low priority, um, and what are some of the costs associated with that, and what are different ways we could piece this together in projects, because I think we realize we're probably not going to get full build, build out amount of money um, all in one year, unless someone has $80 million somewhere stashed, but it seems a little bit unlikely. So we tried to phase it into more uh, manageable pieces in the deployment plan. Um, and so as part of this process, uh, we coordinated it really extensively with uh, groups within the city, but we actually did a lot of external coordination as well. Um, so we had various meetings with um, our other public agency stakeholders, such as E470, RTD, CDOT, uh, the various counties we're in, and the, also the various local agencies and cities we're adjacent to. Um, and our goal with that is really to identify um, what other agencies already have, um, what do they, what do they want to get to and what could um, future projects look like if we were to um, go after maybe a joint project? Um, and then also, if agencies already have extra capacity, is there an ability to share um, resources amongst each other to really help all of us with costs and with our joint goals across the region? Um, so these are just some of the agencies involved. Um, and uh, so that's part of the the plans as well, and you'd see you'll see that in the documents too. 
Um, so Josh and I are both going to kind of cover this one. Um, we're going to dive into a little bit more about each of those three plans and what those um, include. Um, although we'll try not to bore you with too many details because Josh and I can talk about fiber for a lot of hours and we'll try not to take up a whole nother hour on this. Right, Josh? Maybe. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll so, give you some breaks. Uh, yeah, a little bit of breaks. Um, so existing conditions. Uh, for, so for traffic, we have about 400 traffic signals at the city. We're really wanting to communicate primarily to those. Um, but then we also have a lot of different what we call ITS or intelligent transportation systems, like smart cities types of devices out in the field as well. And we want to be able to communicate with those and bring data back from those as well. Uh, so all in all, we have hundred. I said hundreds, but I actually think we have thousands of devices in the field that we're wanting to communicate to. And we are communicating to some of those right now. Um, our traffic network um, for traffic operations and engineering is primarily on radio communication now. Um, so we do have radios kind of point to point, but we're really lacking coverage um, in the southern parts of the city and some par parts where we just don't have line of sight. Um, so that's kind of what our traffic existing conditions look like. And Josh, if you want to touch on the other um, IT and water. And I think the other piece too, Carly, on the traffic side is speed, right? You know, <laughs> when we're looking at speed of their radios, they're a meg. That's one meg, right? So if you think about it at home, you could have a thousand megs of connectivity right now through Comcast. Um, some of our traffic signals are very low. Um, we do see that in the IT side, right? We've replaced a number of our radios. So we do have uh, 1000 meg or gigabit connections out to a lot of our sites. Um, we have actually started moving away from wireless in a lot of our areas just because of the growth of Aurora. Um, you know, a lot of facilities have been built in line of sight for some of our facilities, and we just can't uh, shoot through those, honestly. So we have actually partnered more with Comcast and Lumen to put fiber into those buildings at this particular point. One thing we didn't mention that we should have mentioned earlier, there is a distinction between broadband and city fiber, right? So um, I know Councilman Bergen, Bergen has talked about this before, right? And there, so there is a distinction. We are specifically talking about city facilities. Uh, this is not providing bandwidth or broadband to the home. Now, could there be some possibilities in the future for that to help us do some type of private partnership, public-private partnership, similar to other cities that are in the state? Yes, there may be some opportunity in there. Um, that is not in this plan at this particular point. So just something that I really wanted to point out because we didn't cover that earlier and I should have. So. Um, and I don't know, Angela, if you want to talk a little bit about water or we can cover it either way you'd like to go. Our water uh, system for operational technology and our SCADA platform is really mimics the traffic system, if you will. The number of sensors and the breadth of the network uh, really mimics what traffic is trying to do. This would be just for operational technology, not uh, and and IT would handle anything for any other city department. Yeah. But when we talk about critical infrastructure, we're talking about um, the breadth and depth of uh, keeping track of uh, water and uh, wastewater uh, facilities and locations and infrastructure for operational technology. So the systems are very similar uh, to traffic. Uh, the things you don't see, uh, things that are buried underground, but that's how we're managing uh, the infrastructure for operational technology for water. So I think it was an excellent partnership uh, for all of us to get our heads together and really think about what it takes to in, uh, plan for future development of what fiber really looks like for all the departments in question and to really piece it out in priority order um, to make sure that everybody gets their, their needs met and we can hopefully split the cost across the wire um, to make it beneficial for for all technology for all departments and for all systems. And something uh, Angela actually pointed out, which was a perfect piece there, uh, she's talking about OT operational technology. So the city actually provides um, internet access, email services, stuff like that to water facilities, whereas. The operational technology, like Angela said, is very specific to what water's doing, right? They may have card access systems on that for certain locations. They may have cameras on that system for certain locations. So we actually provide two different networks to many of our city facilities, especially around water, 
because of that. So um, there are some different pieces in there that do come into that. And we, we do what's considered an air-gapped network with our OT or SCADA systems so that those two never shall cross, right? Um, we want to be sure that those systems are protected from internet access, et cetera. So not to say that we might not open it up for very specific amounts of time, but it's very limited. Um, so there are there is a difference between operational technology that water's talking about, what traffic's talking about, than what the city is providing from internet access internet access, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Teams, stuff like that. So there is a distinction in there. Um, so that's part of the reason that we are bringing this all together and working together, to, like Angela said, to really combine resources. Thanks, Josh. And we, we've talked about this a bit for the previous slide too, but we, through this plan, we uh, tried to identify the different communications needs for our different groups and all, all the different needs we have. Um, and so traffic, we need more coverage, higher bandwidth, like Josh said, um, we need more reliability. So right now, if one of our radios goes down, we lose a bunch of signals off our network until it's fixed. Um, so those are the primary needs um, for traffic. Um, and then Josh, you wanna touch quickly on IT's needs as well? Yeah, your... I mean, we have we have bandwidth needs at pretty much every facility, right? You know, obviously we're, we are paying uh, for those leased services at this point. Um, the hard part that Carly and I talk about quite often is uh, the cost that we're paying is not as much as it would be for us to put fiber in. Now, when you start looking at the cost to put fiber into all the traffic signals, we're going to pass all those city facilities. That's when we start actually seeing benefits for cost. Um, so, yes, there's definitely some pieces in there that we would love to start reducing some uh, cost to third party providers. Thanks, Josh. And I, I think from the water perspective, Angela, it's really similar to our traffic needs is the bandwidth reliability and those communications to the remote facilities and field devices. Um, so next slide, uh, we want to touch on some of the benefits to the community uh, through this fiber plan and through our plans to um, improve the bandwidth and reliability, reliability in the future. Um, so having this on the traffic side will really allow us to be a lot more proactive with signal timing. I know I get a lot of complaints about traffic flows. Yeah, but Councilmember Bergen, I think a lot of council members probably get similar complaints of why isn't this operating, you know, more efficiently, better in this area. Um, so th having better communications will allow us to push out updates more quickly. It allow us to get alerts about things that are maybe not functioning correctly more quickly. And it'll just allow us to be a lot more uh, proactive with maintenance and operations of all of our devices. And it'll help us, you know, I think this is something that all of the residents would feel benefit of if we had um, better communications and connectivity. Um, and from, from water as well, um, you know, the ability to have more proactive uh, maintenance of different devices and just it'll make it a lot less likely for different um, service interruptions as well. Uh, so want to get into some of the details about the future plan report and what is in there. So we took all of the existing data from all the different groups and kind of tried to lay out um, what we need as a future network and really just drew it on a map. So these you'll see different color lines. These are all different segments we've identified. Um, the areas identified, the routes are very deliberate uh, to pick up as many facilities traffic signals, sensors along the way, but also to provide redundancy with having different loops of fiber so that if you do have a cut or some issue at one area, you're still getting bandwidth back. It's not like a radio network where one goes down and that's your only path. Um, you'd have different paths to get the communication back, which would be really helpful. Um, so these segments are all colored. We almost, I think we basically ran out of colors in the rainbow. We, when you start using light purple, you know that you've used too many it's colors. Time. We gotta yeah, stop. It's time. <laughs> yeah. So different colors. And then they're also labeled with letters as well. And you'll see more details in the reports that are attached on that. Um, and then you'll also see there's different lines with uh, what different agencies have as far as fiber too. Um, so then in our deployment plan, what we did is we tried to rank the priority of how important these different connections are for each of our groups. Um, sometimes we all agree this is a high, um, you know, high priority area and sometimes, oh, this is high priority for traffic, but low for water and vice versa. Uh, so our consulting team helped go through an effort to rank every, every segment that we identified as very high, high, medium and low priority. And then we use that to say, okay, well, what is the relative, what's the highest priority 
um, for the city overall. Um, and then for each, we all, it also breaks out each department overall. So if water was to get funding specifically for water needs, what would their specific highest priorities be and where could we partner? And it also gets into a lot of the details of what are the approximate costs? How many strands do we need? How do we plan for the future? Are there other agencies interested that we would like to share with and trade resources um, and things like that? So all those details are um, in the deployment plan. And so the total build out cost of the entire network would probably be $80 million or more. We're not asking for $80 million today. So that's not the, don't worry. Yeah, don't, wait, <laughs> not wait, the scary council are. member. Maybe we are. I, I don't, I didn't think we were, but I don't, <laughs> we'll see what Josh says. Um, but we have segments divided up um, and on our map, really what I think is high priority for at least uh, traffic and IT is the north south connectivity through the city. If we had some major, um, you know, a, a, a fiber backbone north south through the city, we could at least reposition radios, get better um, communications all throughout the city, and then connect a lot of our really critical faci facilities along the way. So, um, you know, our north satellite facility where our traffic data comes back is on the north side. We have the municipal center, which you are all are really familiar with. Um, and there's a strong IT need to reach Talon's Reach, and then Water has separate facilities as well. Um, so that's all rolled up into the deployment plan, um, and there's more details on that. Um, so next, I want to get into some next steps, and a lot of these we're actually already working through. Um, so we've been developing this plan together for two or three years now, which is kind of crazy looking back that it's been that long, but it's been a really involved effort. Uh, so what we're doing now is we're trying to pursue some high priority segments. Um, some of which we're really happy to say that we've already gotten funding for. Uh, so one of them, we applied for a Dr. Cog grant and received funding for some critical connections that involve um, tying into actually CDOT's extra strands that they have along, uh, along I-225 and along I-70, but that'll allow us to connect to some city facilities as well, um, as well as the traffic signals at interchanges. Um, so that is something that we've been working with CDOT on, and I will actually have a future IGA that I'll bring forward with CDOT um, related to fiber sharing. And then we'll also have a future IGA for Dr. Cog funding that we were awarded uh, for those fiber connections as well. And then we have a few other um, projects in process as, um, in addition to those. Um, we're also trying to be more proactive in the future, so we're requiring fiber optic conduit to be installed with new roadway construction. So if a contractor is already building a new road, widening a road, they already have it dug up, we're requiring conduit to be put in um, for fiber, because it's a lot cheaper if you do it at once as opposed to trying to come back and bore it in later. Um, and then we're also, um, as different departments and working together, we're trying to add in um, fiber optic communications uh, requests into our, adding it into our CIP and coming forward with uh, future funding strategies for council consideration as well. Um, and with that, our question for you is if the if the TAPS committee supports moving this resolution to adopt the fiber optic master plan forward to the next available study session. And we'll take any questions. I know that was a lot of information. Was. Uh, Council members Lawson, Bergen, do you have any questions uh, for Carly and team? I have a couple. Okay. Um, thank you for the presentation. I'm kind of excited about this um, finally happening. Um, when you had the, the different color coded, and I know you want to do the north-south um, priority, um, how, how is that going to um, help the southern part of my ward, for example, um, off of Arapahoe and, um, you know, along the E-470 corridor? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so here's, here's the map, and what we are really trying to do is get connectivity to bring all the data back to where our signal shop and future traffic communication center will be, and that's at our north satellite facility, which is off of 32nd and Chambers. And so right now our radios go point to point down from there. But if we can get north-south connectivity, um, such as, you know, these segments A and B down chambers, um, that'll allow us to get a lot further south and it'll allow us to get um, high bandwidth connections also to high points so that we can reposition the radios and get better coverage to your ward as well. Because right now we're relying all the way from north, all the way south to your ward. And by doing this, if we could get, you know, maybe down to Parker, 
then we have a lot less space to cover with the radios until we get more communication out out that way, if that makes okay. sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned sh uh, fiber sharing. So mm -hmm. Centennial, um, you know, they joined with Ting and did fiber. Would and they touch obviously Smoky Hill Road. They touch um, along Arapaho as well. So would we be able to share fiber with them off their system? Or? Yeah, that's a really great question as well. Um, so Centennial, um, this is a lot of lines on a legend. See, I told you we ran out of colors, so I guess we started making <laughs> dashes and stuff too. Um, but Centennial's fiber is this dash blue oh, and yellow okay. you see. And definitely, I think if we could get communications north-south, then we can talk to Centennial about sharing opportunities for their extra capacity along Smoky Hill. And they, uh, we did meet with them and they were very supportive and interested in those opportunities. Um, Josh and I also attend um, monthly fiber coordination meetings that Arapahoe County hosts that Centennial's on as well. And so there, there could definitely be opportunities. So this doesn't necessarily mean these will all be 100% only city new conduit types of projects. Um, we're definitely looking towards sharing opportunities and any way to team up and cut costs where we can. Okay, and you mentioned water. Um obviously traffic what about public safety is that a totally different system or is that connected to no. this so that so public safety is included under the city systems so okay. for us to get into talons would be one of our goals right so to really get over to that east part dispatch of, center uh, yep that's correct so you know anything that we can pick up along that line but talons is one of our high priority uh, locations uh, no question we do have district one district two uh, already on city fiber at this particular oh. point. So we provide backup connectivity to them through partnerships with other uh, vendors. But yes, city fiber to Talons is definitely high on our list. So is it vulnerable right now with the, I mean, that's our 911 dispatch center. No, we actually run no. three different connections from three different providers into that. Uh, I'm sorry, three different connections from two different providers in that location. So they are strate strategically diverse, right? So they're not all coming in through the same path. They're coming in through different paths. We're actually getting ready to add another one in the next probably four or five months um, to do a few different backup scenarios with that center. So okay. there are some pieces in the works for that. We're, we're currently in the middle of a design uh, uh, audit uh, for our entire network, and that is one of the considerations that we're looking at. Okay, and then my last question, um, I had a meeting just last week with um, Crown Castle or Castle yeah. Carver, yeah. yeah. Um, and they're talking about their, their technology being obviously different than Lumen. Um, it, it's kind of the micro trenching, but not the bad one. <laughs> like um I forget the company that was going to do that one but anyway is that is that what you're looking at so it wouldn't it goes on the street rather than through but but it's very minimal invasive so ours would actually be um a, a conduit that would be bored and it so it's typically a two inch or a three inch like a a pvc type of conduit that would be bored under underground so Generally, we like to be under the sidewalk or something like that. So it's it's different technology. It's, different. it's okay. Yeah, it's a it can it's a little more expensive, but it's less evasive for the pavement and other utility conflicts and considerations. And Laura, I see you on. If you had or you and Cindy had anything to add, I would just add too that the micro trenching is a direct berry, which is damaging to cable. So we really want this um, significant fiber fiber protected in a conduit. Oh. Um, also. Direct berry is much more susceptible to impacts to the asphalt as well as um, damage just from, you know, if a, somebody scrapes the um, asphalt too closely. So, yeah, thank you. Okay. The other thank piece you. to add in there, too, is something to think about with micro trenching is you're generally running very small cable fiber counts, right? What we're looking at for this particular project is high fiber counts. You know, we may be looking at over 500 strands of fiber in some of these runways, or not runways, sorry, right of ways. So I don't think we're putting anything out at the airport at this moment, but not um, yet. <laughs> so, you know, we would be looking at large, large counts of fiber. Currently, the fiber that we have running north south down the RTD right of way is 144 strands. Wow. So when you when you compare that, you know, fiber to the home may be a single strand. 
So when you're thinking about micro trenching, think about very small fiber counts, whereas this is large fiber counts, large distribution network, essentially, and long runs, right? Some of these could be five miles or more um, that we're running these connections. Great, thank you very much. Any questions? Councilmember Lawson, do you have any questions that you want to add here or comments? You, I was going to ask the question about uh, the other companies uh, available to do that server, but you already answered it, so I don't need to be redundant. Um, and I will tell you that we are working with them, right? There, there are some pieces in there that you know we would love to explore some more. This is kind of the first steps, right? Getting this plan in front of you guys, showing you kind of what our thought process is. And then we can start really working through some of those other pieces uh, at some particular point in the future. Okay. Any questions? All right, then. Wow. Walking right along. This is really awesome. Any miscellaneous matters for consideration that we did not cover today? Laura, oh. do we have anything from your side? Okay. Nothing from Good. staff today. OK, um, so we have some anticipated item six anticipated topics for the next meeting. The IGA between the city of Aurora and the county of Denver, city and county of Denver regarding operations and maintenance plan for 68th Avenue. Um, CDOT Fiber IGA and Connecting Aurora, uh, of course, the transportation uh, grants update that will be coming up to the next meeting. And I'm sure after this weekend's Flurry of activity that we'll have during the workshops. We'll have a lot more to share um, as we're moving on um, with our transportation vision, goals, planning, structure, etc. Um, is there any other new business or anything that I forgot? Okay, Not well, seeing yeah. none, I believe our next meeting will be May the 20. <laughs> Is that right? I believe that is correct. Oh, May 23rd, 23rd, not 25th, that's a Saturday. Uh, 23rd, <laughs> I'm looking at the wrong calendar, May 23rd, okay? I have May 16th as a placeholder. Why do I have the 23rd on my calendar? Then I, I need just to wanted something. to check because Did I think confirm? it's the- I have the like, 16th. Right, I because I think well, I'll let me change my calendar. See, this is why we ask these things because sometimes our dates get goofed up. <laughs> All right, so I will move mine. Okay, Ellie, do you have the same information? Maybe I should just double check with Ellie. Uh, May sixteenth, one p.m. Okay. Hey, May sixteenth. I don't know why I have the twenty third on my calendar. It was probably me. I think it originally was maybe, and then we okay. changed it. We'll make sure that you get an updated invite so that you, it's Marley. on the right day and time. <laughs> okay. As long as somebody knows, you know, I'm, I'm going to be right there with you as the chair. I probably should be. So anyway, um, thank you so much for your time and attention today. And we're moving forward and I'm very excited with the things that we're doing. And with that said, I actually will give you almost a half an hour of your day back. So go do something fun. Get a cup of coffee or something. Okay. <laughs> go outside. Thank you so much. Have an awesome Thanks, day. Thanks, everyone.